Just a moment. Okay, there we go. Yeah, it started. So this is the agenda for today's session. So uh, we will have an introduction to data breach. So we will also look at some statistics and uh, some past breaches as well. And what are the preventive measures that can be taken um, to prevent it in the first place? Because proactiveness is more important when it comes to a data breach than being reactive. And uh, we will also look at Ingram Micro Cybersecurity Portfolio. And also, uh, let's make this session an interactive one so that it won't be a one way thing where I speak and you listen. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, let's start with a question. Yeah, what is data breach? Uh, would uh, anybody like to say something about it? All right. So a data breach is nothing but an information is accessed without authorization. Here we need to look at two things. One is called authentication. The other one is called authorization. An authenticated user doesn't mean that he is authorized to view the data. What does that mean? Um, in an organization, a database administrator or a system administrator will have highest privileges on the database or on the system. And uh, if we do not encrypt data at an application layer, what would happen is the database administrator is he's authenticated to access the system, but he's not authorized to view the data which is stored in the system. So if we are not doing encryption at the right layer, a database administrator can see the data which he is not authorized to see. So that is what it talks about when we speak of data breach. If an information is accessed without authorization, then such security incident is known as a data breach. So according to US Department of Justice, data breach is the loss of control, as in you, you lose the control over the data, uh, as in you don't have, no, anybody can access it, basically. Compromised and unauthorized disclosure, unauthorized acquisition, access for an unauthorized purpose or other unauthorized access to data, whether physical or electronic, is considered a data breach. In other words, what it means is anything which affects the CIA triad for a data is considered data breach. One is confidentiality, wherein it gets unauthorized disclosure. If data is disclosed without an authorized uh, uh, user, uh, by an unauthorized user, and it was acquired through an unauthorized mode, or it is accessed, it means you are losing the confidentiality of the data. Second thing is the integrity of the data. If, if we do not have enough measures to protect the integrity, as in if we are going to have a data, it should be true. It, nobody should change the information. For example, if somebody is going to send an account number to do a transaction, and if somebody sits in the middle um, and changes the account number, uh, and before it has been sent to the recipient, the message loses the integrity. So if we do not have measures to protect the integrity of the data, that is also considered data breach. And the third one is the availability of the data. If the data is being deleted by an unauthorized user, it is also considered a data breach. Okay. Next. We are going to find out the differences between an event, an incident, and a data breach. Before I proceed further, would uh, anybody likes to like to pitch in um, uh, to talk about the differences between event, incident, and the data breach? Okay. So what is an event? An event is any observer, uh, any anything which happens in an environment. Uh, for instance, you try to uh, access a website which is not allowed in your organization, and you get a you get a message saying that 
uh, this message, this website is not access accessible as per um, your company policy. And you get a block error. This is an event. It is not considered an incident. So uh, it is just that you do not know uh, whether that website is blocked or not, and you are trying to access it for maybe for research purpose or anything as such. So when something happens and it gets blocked, it is being observed. OK, uh, so this is considered an event, but it is not considered an incident because it did not cause any um, a damage to start with. So. This is when an event becomes an incident. When it even causes some kind of a damage to an organization, for, ins for instance, since we are talking about data breach, if it is going to uh, end up losing some information, sensitive information, which can which would cause damage to an organization, it is called an incident. So this is where the transition begins an event from an event to an incident. Not all events are incidents and uh, an incident can will always be an event. So that is how it differentiates. So. So for instance, it can be uh, something related to a data which does not co constitute a data breach. But it can affect uh, an, uh, it can affect organization as a whole. So the third thing what we are going to talk about is a breach. This is something which is going to it, which is not going to only affect an organization. It is also going to affect the individuals and it, it, this is something this is going. To, this is a security incident which will which will also breach certain federal breach laws or state and federal breach laws in general. So this would involve uh, customers data. Wherein we have to inform individual customers about it. And uh, this will also involve regulatory fines and other things and uh, we, an organization has an obligation to report data breaches on time. So failing to do so, we will see that in the future slides, but failing to do so will, um, uh, will the organization will end up paying much more fines they are supposed to. So this is the difference between an event and an incident and a breach. So to summarize, event is more of a security event which does not cause any trouble to an organization. An incident is again a security event, but causes some issues to the organization. A breach is a security incident, but it is going to um, um, it, it goes against a state and federal breach laws, wherein uh, uh, th these are incidents, security incidents, which meets specific legal definitions, right? And this also constitutes an organization to report these in, uh, in incidents to uh, federal organizations as well as the individuals, regulatory agencies, and uh, as well as the media, so that everybody is aware of the breach and people take measures to protect their data. So this side, we are going to talk about data breach versus cyber attacks. So these are some of the cyber attacks which results in the data breach. And you can see that human errors constitute to 14% of the data breach. So and phishing is the highest because email is one of the most common uh, threat vectors which is available to um, a cyber criminal to penetrate an organization. So that is one of the reasons why phishing constitutes 46%. And human error is also linked to phishing because lack of awareness by creating cyber cybersecurity awareness to the human element of an organization can reduce phishing related incidents. And uh, that is the best way to prevent the phishing attacks, even though we have the technology to protect against phishing. And 28% of the incident is caused by malware and 12% is caused by ransomware. So also remember, it does not talk only about data disclosure. This is going to speak about uh, affecting the integrity of the data as well as the availability of the data. And what happens when a data is disclosed? So criminals, they sell this data illegally. So what? So an identity of an individual is very important. So given the situation we are currently in now, think of it this way. What would happen? Um, if a, if a user's health insurance data is leaked. So people can use his identity to claim his insurance and by the time when he reaches the hospital, he won't have access to uh, the insurance amount which were uh, which is already utilized by the by the criminal. 
So these are some of the things uh, which are which has been treated very sensitive. And as per Symantec, uh, they also sell for. They also sell for a good amount. Yeah, every single we, we think that certain things are not important and we try not to safeguard them, but these are very important. So that is that is one of the reasons why even uh, from in our individual personal life, we should we should be careful on what we are sharing on the Internet, like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you name it. So we have to be uh, sensitive about it, about protecting our data as well as organizations should be sensitive about protecting their customers data as well as their employees. Another data breach statistics is this. 25% of the organizations, uh, the, the total number of reported breaches is, reaches only 25%. It means that not every organization is reporting their breach. Um, and, uh, there, are, there are instances where they think that they can get away with that. And uh, when they get caught, they get to pay more fines, basically. And it also damages their reputation. And small and medium enterprises, most of the companies, especially in the UAE, yeah, so more than 90% are small and medium enterprises. So if 43% of these enterprises are going to be get affected, it's uh, it's more like uh, these industries. More, see, we are comprised, as in UAE is comprised, more of these SMEs, and uh, more of them are going to be affected by this. And the one primary reason is SMEs do not invest um, or do not go for the right investments to uh, to uh, rather than to save cost or to protect breaches. So uh, SME fails to understand that if you have the right protection, you you are not only saving cost, but you are also protected against brand reputation damage as well as future penalties. And some of these uh, data breaches occurs uh, because it has been uh, an hacker's uh, target uh, and hacker is targeting these individuals or account organization and that is how the data breach occurs. And the other one is uh, due to internal people. So uh, this is called insider threats. So 34% of the data breach occur due to insider threats. And the remaining, the last but not least, 24% occurs due to human error. So this is something we have to be very careful. So uh, there are ways to prevent a human error. One of the key ways is cybersecurity awareness. Creating awareness to the uh, employees in the organization will safeguard against breaches. Okay. So what should companies do when a data breach occur? As per GDPR, I, I referenced GDPR here. The reason being is it is one of the well-known standards these days when it comes to data breaches. So as per GDPR, you have to report a breach within 72 hours. Along with that, you need to do certain things. Reset the passwords, inform people, uh, monitor your credit accounts, credit consider also consider a credit freeze so that your credit is not misutilized. And uh, you should also watch uh, your inbox carefully, implement multi-factor authentication as early as possible, as soon as the date, data breach occur. So one of the factors, uh, failing factors, or one of the important thing is we have to move from a traditional authentication mechanism to a multi-factor authentication mechanism, at least for our critical applications, so, which is very important these days. Failing to do so can result in multiple breaches and um, Actually speaking, having a static password, complex password is kind of dead now. So even NIST, who came up with the initial password policy, they recommend more of a um, passphrase. The reason being is having a password policy like 68 characters, 10 characters, multiple combinations, and, and, and people end up writing those passwords in an unsafe, uh, which is unsafe. So, even Nest recommends a passphrase. They do. They they ask us to move away from uh, uh, password expiry. Instead of that, have a big passphrase. Use that and move to a multi-factor authentication. Multi-factor authentication is going to be beneficial. So if you are going to add a one-time password kind of mechanism to authenticate the users uh, as part of uh, when they log into a critical application, it's going to save uh, safeguard them from a static password discovery. These are some of the things or the companies can do and should do as part of when a data breach occur. One of the most important thing is notification. 
So now we are going to talk about some uh, breaches that happened in the past and what went wrong and why did the breach occur and the fines associated with that. One of the most known breaches is Yahoo data breach. What happened uh, is that Russian hackers gained access to Yahoo's internal environment and uh, which affected 500 million people, 500 million people records. So it included names, phone numbers, password questions which they used. What happens with password challenge questions is you tend to use the answers in multiple different sites. So since they recovered the password challenge questions and their answers, what would have happened is they can bypass the security of their other accounts as well. And uh, password recovery emails, it gives them more access to the other emails of the end user and they and an encryption value unique to an each account, which uh, allowed them to uh, decrypt the data of each account. And uh, it was exposed between 20, 2015 and 2016. And it was as simple as this. This all happened because an employee clicked on a phishing email. So they usually say it, it everything was lost in a single click. So we have to be very careful and understand the importance of cybersecurity awareness to a, a proper cybersecurity awareness and a proper um, mail security tool would have prevented this from happening. At least it would have not led to this much of an effect. So how did in the end it affected the finance and the business of Yahoo? So they did not disclose Failure for early disclosure to SEC resulted in a $35 million fine. They settled down for a $35 million fine because they failed to disc disclose this particular event on time. And their settlement charges increased to $85 million, which they could have reduced. Attorney's fees caused around $35 million. Cyber, cyber incident response costed them around $16 million. Forensic investigation costed around $5 million. Additional legal costs costed around $11 million. All this can be prevented if they had a proper cybersecurity program in place. And it should not, it shouldn't have been a reactive program alone. It should have been a proactive as well as a reactive program. And also for a proper data breach recovery plan would have, would have saved them millions. And it also affected their, uh, one of the company was about to acquire Yahoo. It also uh, affected their plans. And uh, they had to sell it for $350 million less than what was initially agreed upon as part of this acquisition. The next thing which we are going to talk about is a Elastic Service uh, Search Server Data Breach, which resulted again in a disclosure of data. And Elasticsearch is more and more in use due to uh, the data analytics and other things which are uh, which are pumped in and uh, which requires a lot of data. So uh, uh, this was a search server, Elasticsearch server, which was uh, stored uh, Elasticsearch server database, which was storing people information, uh, which was uh, which was um, used by an acquiring company who was doing people data research. Security researcher Bob. Uh, discovered 250 million records exposed from an Elasticsearch server database, which costed or which resulted in a fine of 20 million euros. It included the email addresses, IP address of from where these email addresses were accessed, and the support case detail of those users for the last 14 years. And look at the timeline. It was exposed in. 2018 and uh, we are still uh, we, we were still thinking that 2019 was not a bad year for security incidents right and it was passed in December 31 2019 and it was as simple as misconfiguration so this is one of the human errors we we would like to highlight security misconfiguration you can have the right tools in the organization but if you do not configure it right it, and it, it will end up into a data breach. So if they had right auditing in place, they could have uh, fixed the issue before. It should have been a proactive auditing, 
they would have found, found the problems in their configuration, they could have fixed and they could have prevented this data breach from happening. The uh, next one we are going to talk about, this is the third global data breach which we are talking are going to talk about. This is a GES data breach. So the important of this one is third party vendor audits, right? So when we are going to outsource something, we have to be very careful about our audits. We need to ensure not only our personal environment is protected, we should also ensure wherever we are going to store the data, that environment is also protected. What happened with the D, uh, G, uh, GE data breach was related to Canon Business Process Services Inc. They were the external uh, uh, service provider for GE, and uh, GE was storing their documents with them. So they had information about their uh, GE's current employees, former employees, and beneficiaries entitled to benefits. So all those data was leaked. And basically what happened with this is unauthorized user gained access to this particular data. So it included names, addresses of the individuals, social security numbers, their password details. It, it included everything that is needed for an identity theft. Anybody uh, in, in this world, uh, if they get all this information, they can prove themselves as something else. Be because this world is more digital, it is data driven. So anything with this information, you, are, you can impose anyone else. <clears throat> So when did it occur? It occurred between February 3rd to February 2020. It, it is also one of the most recent ones. And, and it was exposed in February 28th. Uh, <clears throat> and this has resulted in a loss of data as well as the reputation when it comes to uh, G. So the next com uh, couple of breaches is about um, our Gulf region. Yes. So I think someone's on. You know. um, <clears throat> so the next two breaches are related to our Gulf region uh, because these breaches are not, uh, we are not uh, <clears throat> exempted from attacks. So we should also be careful since we are part of this particular region as well. So this one we are going to talk about Saudi Aramco's data breach. So what happened is, um, <clears throat> Shamun is the name of the virus. It is a, it's more of a worm. It's a self-replicating worm, which attacked, uh, which attacked more than 35 computers, 35,000 computers of Saudi Aramco. And uh, what it did is, do you remember we said anything which constitutes one of the CAA triad? Uh, which affects adversely to one of the CAA triad is going to constitute a breach. So what this particular virus did was it started deleting these files. Of um, deleting, uh, it did not care about what files it deleted. It started deleting everything. And uh, again, this was due to a phishing attack. So uh, Again, it can it could have been prevented if there was proper mail security environment and of course cyber security awareness along its employees. So uh, it deleted data across the organization. It bring down the uh, company to its knees and then it took time for them to recover. And one of the most uh, noticeable thing is it uh, it occurred during the Ramadan period wherein uh, the organizations in the Gulf region they tend to work less hours. And uh, and kind of a little relaxed during that period, due to the fasting and other things. And it was exposed in August 15, 2012. All right. The next one we are going to talk about is the breach which occurred with Bahrain Petroleum Company. <clears throat> So this was again a data ma ma wiping malware targeted. This is more of a targeted attack and uh, the malware's name was called Dustman. And uh, the good thing is they were able to detect and uh, prevent a major damage, 
damage and uh, that uh, that is one of the very good thing because of the proactive measures that were in place again it did not care about what data it deleted it deleted anything and everything um and when did it occur it, uh, it was again a, a recent attack it occurred in january 2020 so and and having said all those things one more trend which is pre prevalent when it comes to uh, the most recent ransomware attacks is ransomware has taken the next step what they are doing is um their idea is to blackmail people saying that um if you if you do not pay us we will not decrypt your data but they have gone one step further they are taking a double pronged approach a two pronged approach wherein before they encrypt the data they copy the data and now they uh, they blackmail in a different way they not only say that you will not have access to your data they also start saying that if you do not pay us we will start disclosing your data so they are now affecting the confidentiality confidentiality and as well as availability of data so protection against advanced persistent threats is more important than ever to protect our organization if we go and say we are not paying bitcoin we have backups no they are not stopping there they are moving one step further and say okay you don't have to pay us bitcoins or anything but we will if you do not pay that we are going to disclose your data that way even if you have a backup to safeguard your availability you are losing the confidentiality so hackers are becoming more advanced so we have to also up the game so we should start investing on proactive measures for protection as well as along with our reactive existing reactive measures. So measures to prevent data breaches. How how will you protect? So it should it should an organization consist of three pillars primarily. One is the people, the other one is the process, and the third one is the technology. So people, processes, technology. So our protective measures, the proactive measures which we spoke of, should cover all three pillars. It should be a holistic approach, not, a, not an individualistic approach. How do you, uh, uh, what can you do when it comes to protection uh, uh, against attacks on people? Yeah? People are considered the weakest link in, in general when it comes to cybersecurity. The reason being is you can have the latest technology, you can have the rate, uh, a very good robust process in place. But if you do not have a, uh, if your people or the employees do not have the right set of awareness, you will still be breached. So one of the main and most important thing to consider is to, um, to raise awareness along uh, uh, to your people. And to do that, do that, you need to conduct cybersecurity awareness programs. In your organization. So when it comes to cybersecurity awareness programs, it should it is not a one-time activity. It should be a periodic one, and when time needs it, it should be an, on a dog basis as, as well. And also ensure that it is relevant. And one more thing we need to make sure that when it comes to a cybersecurity awareness program. The people should take it back to their personal life. So if they can implement everything in their personal life, it can also be implemented in, uh, in, the, in the official life. So it should not be uh, in such a way that it, uh, it is created to protect the organization's asset. Rather, it should be created to create awareness for the people and change their mindset about security. They should not start thinking that, OK, we have the antivirus uh, we can connect anything to our systems now if you do not uh, if you are not allowed to connect a usb drive do not connect it if you um, if you are not allowed to copy data you do not copy it and we need to make them understand so when certain data or in an environment which is highly secure it is better protected over there they should not move it from a highly secure environment to a less secure environment so all these things can be achieved by creating an awareness so so that cybersecurity awareness program is one of the key things when it comes to educating people, the weakest link uh, when it comes to security for an organization. Next thing is process improvements. As I said earlier, you can improve upon the process that are used in an organization. So when we talk about process improvements, it can be a change to the password policy, right, in an organization. It, you can say, okay, all your um, critical applications should have multi-factor authentication and 
you should also implement risk based authentication. Um, would, I, would anyone like to uh, speak about risk based authentication and multi factor authentication? Any differences between these two? Hello. All right, I'm also looking at um, the messages just to see. OK, there are some questions. I, uh, I did not see the messages, so let me quickly see them as well. So. Um, no, victim must uh, must not pay for it. So when it comes to investigations, uh, it is not the responsibility of a victim. It's the responsibility of an organization. Organization must pay for it. It should be an external investigation as well as an internal investigation when it comes to data breach investigations. So that is the reason why we saw Yahoo's um, um, a loss. It, it had legal fees. It has forensic analysis fees and other things. And there is a question about Walmart suit under CCPA for data. Yep, so it's 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 also the same thing. So uh, this has happened, uh, if I'm not wrong, in uh, uh, recently um, in the past few days, actually speaking. So this is uh, this was protected against California data law. It is not as serious as GDPR, but still they will be sued under uh, <coughs> California's regulation. Um, so this was mainly due to their uh, uh, due to the failure to 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 do protective measures, as we spoke earlier. So if you are not proactive, people are also considering proactiveness as a measure to uh, gauge an organization security factors. So this the one of the reasons what happened with this particular one is they did not um, uh, have enough protection in their environment to protect the privacy rights of the consumers. So this was the main reason for this. And uh, and again, so the damages will, uh, as I said earlier, uh, California's um, uh, penalties is much far much lesser than uh, GDPR. So uh, they will not be affected. If it was a GDPR environment, they will be affected even more then uh, what they are going to face when it comes to California uh, laws, California privacy laws. Um, yes, the uh, I hope I answered your question, Alain. Yeah. And the uh, next one is cybersecurity insurance can provide some level of protection in terms of fees and damages. Yes, it does. So, um, uh, a AAG, uh, there is a company named AAG. He, they are one of the uh, <clears throat> uh, biggest cybersecurity insurance companies. I'm not promoting them in any ways, but yeah. So for different type of breaches, they have registered different claims, and uh, I can also uh, and cybersecurity insurance. Yes, that is one of the key things an organization has to do as part of the proactive measure. They should have a proper cybersecurity insurance, and uh, some of the cybersecurity insurance will also cover your forensic investigation costs as well. So yes, so you can have cybersecurity insurance. It's not some level. It, it will have a greater level of protection, of course. Yes. And Alim again. Uh, yes, multi-factor authentication is a two-factor authentication, as you said. Uh, so basically what happens is, um, so when it comes to two-factor authentication, we use either one of, uh, uh, either two of these factors, what you know, what you are, and what you have. So if you use any two of these factors, it's called a two factor authentication. There is another thing called risk based authentication. Coupled with this two factor authentication, you can also introduce something called a risk based authentication, which will add additional layers. So if you if you detect that, OK, this person usually come uh, um, connects to the server only from uh, Dubai, for example, and all of a sudden he is connecting from India or Australia. So you can introduce additional authentication mechanism to verify the identity of the user. So that is called risk based authentication. So also introduce two factor authentication as well as risk based authentication for your critical applications. These are very important. Now, uh, privilege access management, it talks about a totally different thing. Risk based authentication is related to um, adding an additional layer of authentication. It can be a normal user for, in for instance. If you log into a certain bank account, when you are in, in your home country, 
you will not be asked to authenticate and uh, additionally when you do a certain transaction. But you, when you're away from the home country, due to the factor that it, it, uh, it detects an anomaly, it detects a changes in behavior, the, an additional authentication, a reinforced authentication mechanism will be passed in to verify your identity. That is called risk-based authentication. Privilege access management, that is another key topic. Um, privilege access management is more about uh, protecting the privileged users in an organization who has access uh, or privileged user accounts in an organization. For instance, uh, your database administrators. Yeah, Rather than having a static password, you will have a uh, privilege access management system which will uh, compile all their passwords and access to the critical servers uh, behind them will be only through this privilege access systems. What, gen what they generally do is, you, you will be logging into this privilege access system and from there, you will be either be able to retrieve the credential to authenticate yourself to the, uh, to the server, the uh, critical server, or you will directly connect from the, uh, from the system directly. Uh, you will directly connect from the system itself wherein it doesn't even have to disclose your passwords. So uh, that, that, is, that is what a privilege access management system is. And what will happen is there are multiple things you can do with this privilege access management systems. After the access, you can set it, okay, once I'm done with the server, you can reset the password uh, automatically. So there won't be any more static passwords on the server. Or even if you knew the password, that password will no longer be valid after your session. So that is privilege access management. And this based authentication can be applied for anybody. Privilege access management is for privileged user accounts. I hope uh, that is clear now. Yeah. So if you have any more questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Um, um, so privilege ma access management is one of the process improvements you can do for your privileged accounts. Privilege access management is not limited uh, to your uh, user accounts. It can also be used for your service accounts. For instance, you don't no longer have to use any static database passwords. You can link your privilege access management system uh, with your application. What will happen is uh, during the connectivity process, it will get the pro uh, username and password on the fly and it will try to connect to the, your database. That way, your data, you, can, you, you don't have to worry about your service accounts any longer. You don't have to change passwords on your service accounts. Privilege access management will take care of it. And, um, and as we all know, there, there is usually, a, uh, these service accounts are usually set not to expire. So that is something we can prevent by using privilege access management. So as I said earlier, it is not only for the user accounts, it can also be used for your service accounts and much more. So that is the benefit of privilege. Man uh, so if you introduce privilege access management in your environment, that is going to be a process improvement as well. Risk based authentication, password policies, anything as such. So these are some of the process improvements uh, which you can bring in to your environment. And the next one is deploying latest technology. So that is one of the key things to prevent data breaches. Um, when I'm, when I'm talking about deploy latest technology, let me also go back to the process improvement part of it. Uh, ha, has any one of you heard of um, red teaming? Red team, blue team. What does a red team do? Let me also go back to the chat comments section. Purple teams, yeah, yeah, okay. Offense and defense, fantastic. Uh, yes, so exactly, exactly. You can also speak if you are if you like to voice out. It, it doesn't have to be only the chat message. Unmute yourself if you'd like to speak something. Please do so. Yeah, I'm more than happy to listen. It'll be two ways. Yeah. So yes, red team is one of the things what you can do when it comes to process improvements. Right. So we know that we have a blue team. Most companies have, or uh, they should have a SOC team, for example. Consider them as a blue team. They will be looking at what is happening and um, uh, they, they will they will stick to uh, monitoring the incidents and uh, your SIM or anything which is happening when it comes to security events in an organization. That is a blue team or a defensive team. It is a more of a reactive team. 
The offensive team is a red team. So what these guys do is they test the technology in your organization. It can be a, a team within your organization or you can reach out, for example, in Gram Micro, we, we do profans, uh, provide red team exercises. So um, what red team actually does is it will enter your organization and uh, do an ethical hacking job where they will check for all sorts of vulnerabilities, all sort of um, uh, things that can happen due to misconfiguration vulnerabilities um uh, uh people failure human errors they can find anything as such uh so we can we can we can <clears throat> yes i was also so we they can do anything as such to identify flaws in your environment so and you can also do a offensive and defensive practice together so that these guys can attack and defense team can try to come up with defense mechanisms to prevent any further damage. That way you will also improve uh, your organization security posture as well as your SOC team or the blue team's uh, responsive capabilities. So yes. So we do have many environments in our portfolio. So based on the, uh, when it comes to the products for PAM related products, privilege access management related products, we do have many in our portfolio across the globe. And uh, if there is any such requirement, do let us know. We cater based on, uh, based on the regions so certain regions we have agreements with certain vendors for instance in uh, um, for uae uh, we have um, agreements with microfocus one of the good, one of the best products across the globe uh, net Net identity manager and uh, we have uh, we have quest we have uh, uh, quest is also one of the best uh, when it comes to pam in itself and we also have ibm in uae other regions have more vendors as well, so uh, I, I'm I'm speaking only of the UAE. Yeah. So based on your uh, based on your requirements, we can we can recommend. So Quest, for instance, uh, I'll name to your question. Quest, for instance, uh, can be used at certain places. Microfocus, for instance, can be used at certain places. It depends on uh, your requirement as a whole. So based on your requirements, we are more than happy to provide you with the right solutions. So yeah. So going back to technology. So process consider of, uh, we, we spoke of many things when it comes to process, including the red team and blue team, and uh, Indra Micro has the capabilities to serve you with those aspects as well, including improvements to your uh, policies, uh, guidelines. Cons we also provide consultancy services and, as, and things as such. We will see those things in the future slides. So latest technology. Our latest technology, so, uh, so do you think Endpoint protection software, the traditional one, which we were using for ages now, uh, is enough to protect against advanced persistent threats these days. What, what, what do you what do you think as a whole? Or what is the next? You can also pitch in and say what is the next level of protection we should invest on when it comes to malware protection on endpoints, as in your servers and workstations. Um, before we start, so let me let me talk about advanced persistent threat a little bit. Advanced persistent are not like usual ones. They're, these are the ones which bypass your traditional mechanisms. So you need to come up with different ways like sandboxing technologies. And for your endpoints, you need to also include EDR. Uh, so endpoint detection and response. So these are uh, capabilities, but that doesn't mean that these are the only things which you need. So you should also have your endpoint protection, which will have a whole set of uh, protection mechanisms like your antivirus, anti-malware, host-based intrusion protection system, firewalls, and uh, other things as such. Adding to that, you can complement it with advanced threat protection technology like your EDRs, endpoint detection and response. They will not only assist you to detect a uh, uh, based on behaviors and certain aspects of it, they will also add an additional option to respond to the threats at real time. So you are you have better protection. So for endpoint devices, do not stick only to a uh, endpoint protection capabilities. It is no longer enough. For instance, ransomware protection, you're gone if your data is encrypted. So you need technology to detect, which which detects things without the uh, dependency on a signature. So EDR or endpoint detection and response helps you to do that. So yeah, IPS, next generation firewall, yeah. So, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, so uh, Mohammed, uh, 
we so it's it's not a single technology which is used for protection for instance you can look at what alim has mentioned yeah so he's mentioned endpoint edr so these are endpoint technologies sandboxing is more of a networking technology uh predominantly used at a networking layer ips next gen firewall all these are important so coupled with this we should also add um your email security your web security as well so you need to look at things in a holistic way so uh, technology yes the uh, most recent technologies you need to uh, you need to look at ways to protect against apts yes so uh, that is so uh, I, I cannot say so we can we can adopt technology so everyone does certain things in their own better way yeah there are multiple EDR vendors in the market. So there are some EDR technologies which can coexist with the, uh, the EPP protection. That There are some EDR technologies which is built into their product. It also depends on your existing licenses. So if you have any questions around that, please do reach out to us. Uh, we have Solution Architect. I'm one of the Solution Architect in the Center of Excellence Cybersecurity in Dubai. So we will be more than happy to find the right products for you. As in, we do not, as I, as I always say, so our team does not work on products only. We work on holistic solutions. So if you come up with a requirement, we find we can do an assessment of the environment and find the right solution for you. So what are, whatever you are missing, we can name a few. We can find, uh, we can give you the differences and tell you, okay, these are the technologies. This is the capabilities you get uh, between different technologies. And, uh, and based on the differences, you can make an informed decision. So we do not seek to, uh, a single vendor, we, we try to be vendor agnostic as much as we could. Um, the only limitation will be the vendors we support in that region. So that is our only limitation. Other than that, uh, we try to provide uh, a vendor agnostic solution so that you can mix and match, choose it uh, based on the requirements as well as your budget. So that's how we do things here. Yeah. All right. Thank you for the questions. A anything more? I'm more than happy to answer. OK, I'll come back to the chat screen in a while. All right, so uh, deploy latest technology. As I said, it is not limited to a certain thing. You need to uh, use the latest technology. Um, you need to find different ways to implement them um, uh, based on your <clears throat> organization's uh, needs. So your, your protection mechanism should cover all bases. Cybersecurity awareness program, process improvements, deploying the latest technology which is available in the market to protect against the mo most sophisticated of threats which are happening. All right. So some of the primary me measures to avoid data breach includes awareness training, encrypting customer database. So when it comes to encrypting customer database, it, data is the key. So as I said earlier, Try to encrypt, so you, you should, you, you, your technology should encrypt it. You try not to depend on a third party. Sorry, try not to depend on a third party to encrypt the data, like uh, TDE, which means that if you're going to encrypt the data using SQL, uh, Microsoft SQL and uh, the technology which comes with it, uh, TDE, Transparent Data Encryption, what happens is it will still allow your database administrator to see the data. If it is mission critical data, encrypt it at the application layer. The application, before storing the data inside the database, it has to encrypt the data. So that is very much possible. You need to start doing that. So probably TDE, for example, it might work with when it comes to PCI DSS or a compliance-based security. Uh, TDE might be enough uh, as a bare minimum. So anyone, an outsider cannot uh, access that data. But you need to trans, uh, transfer to a risk-based security. There should be a transfer. Uh, we, we should move from uh, compliance-based security to a risk-based security to protect against the advanced threats. So that is what is being proactive. Compliance-based security is more like a reactive approach these days. So we need to move uh, to a proactive approach to a risk-based approach. Compliance-based security is an ideal place to start with, but it should it is the bare minimum of security. But in, if you move to risk-based security, that is where you, you would reach the ideal level and uh, to protect yourself against the future um, the future threats, basically. 
So you need to have multi-level passwords as well as uh, uh, there are detection mechanisms uh, to access database with customer information. So multi-level passwords, what, what we are trying to say is an application password, data password. Along with that, you should also have an encryption uh, in place and multiple things. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, use multi-factor authentication and have a disaster plan and your disaster plan should also include a uh, insurance, cyber uh, insurance to protect your organization. Advanced mal malware detection software, advanced persistent threat detection software and prevention software should be in use. And uh, use the latest firewalls. Do not stick to the old ones to use next gen firewalls, which are much better than the traditional firewalls. Start using them. So uh, we are almost done and uh, I will discuss a little bit with, when it comes to in-ground micro cybersecurity capabilities in the next few slides. So from in our portfolio, we cover all bases. This particular list of vendor uh, is limited to UAE, but we cover more than this globally when it comes to cybersecurity vendors. So uh, we cover all bases. When it comes to people, we do cybersecurity trainings. Our cybersecurity training moves across uh, all layers. So we offer foundational trainings. Please reach out to our PMs. They can organize ones for you or account managers. Advanced cybersecurity trainings. It includes um, uh, anything from CISSP to um, CIPT, CIPM and extra. Privacy related training. Uh, we have data privacy officer uh, in house who can uh, who is authorized to conduct privacy trainings. It also covers uh, CIPP, for example. So become a data privacy officer, you have to do two trainings, CIPM and CIPP. This is rather than saying one of the best, this is the first and foremost, or this is the only training which is available when it comes to privacy training. And uh, we do training for that. And when it comes to process, we can, we do perform technical assessments for you. We uh, conduct, uh, we, we do all sorts of it when it comes to technical assessment from source code review to penetration testing. Um, and when it comes to consulting service, uh, uh, we, we do everything as well. Uh, not only consulting, we do not limit ourselves to consulting services. We also do audit uh, auditing, uh, anything you would need an external auditor to perform. We are more than happy to assist you with that. And when it comes to managed security services, we can we have in-house socks. Uh, so, uh, what happens with an in-house sock is if you are going and reaching out to a small customer. Do you remember we spoke of SMEs who might not have uh, a budget to invest on a complete dedicated sock for themselves? So that's where we can utilize our managed security so uh, services capabilities. That in. Uh, we can create the SOC, we, we can uh, let them use our SOC. We provide SOC as a service. So our managed security service works in both ways. One is they can send logs to our environment. We take care of everything for them. We do it analysis in our environment or if they prefer, not only for SMEs, if, if, if somebody prefer they, are, they only need a staff augmentation kind of a thing, we can also do that as well. So uh, what does that mean is they will have everything in their environment, their SI and their devices, uh, but we will be managing that environment for them. So none of the data leaves their environment for uh, uh, for uh, these are for industries which are sensitive about their logs leaving outside their environment. And when it comes to technology, we have a very big list of technology which we support from different vendors. So uh, as I said earlier, this is a UAE based one. So we have almost every technology we can look for uh, when it comes to uh, uh, with different vendors. And as I said earlier, when you come to us as a cybersecurity COE, we provide solutions. We provide multiple uh, products from different vendors rather than saying, OK, you can go with this particular product. So we give you products comparisons and provide you uh, the choice of uh, choosing the right product, basically. So this is our training portfolio. In foundational trainings, we cover fundamentals of cybersecurity, cyber safe and information risk. And we also do uh, trainings similar to our webinars on uh, almost every Wednesdays we do trainings. So we are going through a, um, a series for uh, CISSP now. So and we also have our past recordings in our YouTube channel. So and these are our certification trainings which we offer CISSP, Security Plus, CISP, Cyber Secure, First Responder. 
So, uh, and when it comes to risk and compliance, we uh, do these trainings uh, as well for your risk and compliance officers. And we also have trainings when it, when it comes to uh, creating awareness, uh, uh, when it comes to creating awareness for your uh, users, employees, we have IoT and cybersecurity related trainings, uh, blockchain and cybersecurity. We, uh, we have all these things uh, on our webinars as well. Artificial intelligence and cybersecurity. And when it comes to privacy related, uh, we do CIPM and CIPPE. So along with uh, to become a data privacy officer, you need CIPM that is or CIPT, one of those uh, certifications, along with one CIPP certification that makes you a data privacy officer. So uh, if you gather two of those certifications, you get it. CIPP Europe uh, talks about GDPR uh, related one and uh, privacy regulations in the UAE. And um, so does anyone aware of the recent privacy regulation, which privacy act, which is launched in UAE or in? Uh, yeah, uh, let me let me not make it easy. The UAE one. Okay. So recently in uh, in Dubai, they have released a um, an act wherein uh, from July 12th, uh, everybody should be July 13th, I believe, should uh, uh, should follow a privacy regulation that is kind of new for this region. So uh, so it is kind of a uh, uh, phenomenal thing when it comes to UAE as a whole. So it's a start for many things which is going to happen in UAE. And uh, organizations are given time for three months. Within three months, they have to implement uh, the uh, uh, security measures to protect privacy of their uh, customers or data which they hold. Uh, after three months, they they will start be they will become penalized if they are not uh, if they fail to meet the requirements basically. Okay, so uh, going back to. I believe we are almost done. So we do GDPR foundations, we do GDPR implementation trainings as well. So, uh, yep, that is it. And going back to the chat screen, there are some couple of questions. One from uh, Alim. Yes, Alim, as I said earlier, so we are not limited only to uh, web security. We should also do email security and uh, other aspects. So we need to look at holistic picture to have advanced protection against threats. And uh, manage SOC, as I was saying, Ingram Micro has a managed SOC, so we do the managed SOC for you. So, uh, are you referring to the technologies which uh, you're looking for, or uh, I'm not sure. So, but we have a managed SOC for ourselves, so we offer it as a service, SOC as a service. So we take care of anything in there in, in a customer's environment from a security perspective. Um, so that is more or less it. We are we are on time, I believe. And uh, if you have any more questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. If not, um, have a nice day and the rest of the weekend. Yeah. So I'll I'll wait for five more minutes for any more questions before I leave the session. And thank you everyone for joining. I hope it was a productive session. <laughs>